Hi, my name is Scott Simpson. In this lecture, we'll be discussing some basic cardiovascular findings on chest x-ray with CT and MRI correlation. Adequate assessment of the major cardiovascular structures is critical for accurate chest x-ray interpretation. This should always include a careful scrutiny of the aorta, pulmonary arteries, and cardiac silhouette. Attention should be made to not only size, but also location, overall shape, and density. We'll be discussing some key signs that can be used to help identify abnormalities of these cardiovascular structures, as well as some important clinical clues that could help arrive at a more specific diagnosis and guide additional imaging if necessary. Let's first focus on the aorta. The ascending aorta should not normally extend beyond the lateral border of the right atrium. That is, its contour should be more medial or closer to the spine. The aortic knob should be sharply defined, smoothly round, and to the left of the trachea, which often has a subtle indentation from the aortic arch. The descending thoracic aorta is normally closely opposed to the spine, has a uniform and straight course. In older age, we can sometimes see the descending aorta bow off the spine, which could be a manifestation of decreasing height or systemic hypertension. Now let's contrast these normal findings to some diseased aortas by applying some of the rules we just learned. In this case, we can see that the ascending aorta extends beyond the outer edge of the right atrium. In addition, the aortic knob appears enlarged, less circular, and less smooth than typically seen. The descending thoracic aortic stripe is also quite lateral to the thoracic spine and has a very undulating course. These findings would suggest the presence of an aortic aneurysm. Clinical history and comparison x-rays are quite important in this scenario. Should the patient have no priors or be presenting with acute chest pain, particularly if radiating to the back, a CTA of the chest should be considered to assess for dissection. This patient had prior chest x-rays that showed this to be a stable finding and was currently asymptomatic. This patient has a known aortic aneurysm and has been undergoing annual surveillance imaging with MRI. Aneurysms can be surveilled with CT or MRI and this patient was being followed with the latter. This is an axial non-contrast MRA black blood image of the aorta at the level of the aortic arch. As we move more inferiorly, we can see the ascending as well as the descending thoracic aortas. The ascending aorta is aneurysmal, measuring 5.7 centimeters, and has been slowly enlarging over the last few years. More caudal image demonstrates the aortic root, the descending thoracic aorta, as well as some of the cardiac chambers. We also note that the aortic root, that is the very first part of the aorta just beyond the aortic valve and proximal to the sonotubular tubular junction, is also aneurysmal. Given gradual growth, this patient was electively repaired. An aneurysm is defined as being greater than 150% of the normal vessel caliber. The question then becomes, what is a normal vessel caliber? And that is not a straightforward answer with regard to the aorta. Caliber varies by age, sex, body surface area, and the part of the aorta measured, that is ascending versus descending. As noted in a recent white paper, the ascending and descending thoracic aortas are said to be aneurysmal when measuring greater than five and four centimeters respectively. They are often repaired electively when measuring greater than 5.5 centimeters, unless the patient has risk factors such as Marfan's or bicuspid aortic valve, conditions that predispose these individuals to dissection. What about this case, PA and lateral views of the chest? What is wrong with this aorta? The ascending aorta looks to be okay, but what about the aortic knob? We do not see it in its normal expected position. Also, which way is the trachea moving? In this case, we can see that it's subtly deviated to the left. And which way does it normally move with a left side aortic arch? We should see it normally to the right. So what could be going on here? This actually represents a right-sided aortic arch. The aortic knob is on the wrong side. Also note how we do not see the normal descending aortic stripe. It is now somewhat to the right of midline. What about on the lateral view? What's going on with the trachea here? We can see that it's displaced anteriorly. So not only is it going the wrong way to the left, it's also being pushed anteriorly. This is because the right side of the aortic arches are typically associated with an aberrant left subclavian artery. This has a course that's both posterior to the trachea and the esophagus. Because it's horizontally oriented, it's gonna appear as a circle on the lateral view. 
In addition, for congenital reasons, these aberrant subclavian arteries can become dilated, which can then push on the trachea and esophagus, potentially producing symptoms. So how does this look on CT? Near the thoracic inlet, we can see a superiorly located right-sided aortic arch. Also note the aberrant left subclavian artery. Further down, we can, serve, we can confirm that the arch is truly right-sided. We can also see the abnormal course of the left subclavian artery, which is posterior to the trachea. Also observe how dilated it is at its origin. When dilated, this is known as a diverticulum of Coumarin. This dilation is what deviated the trachea anteriorly on that lateral view. And look at the poor esophagus, which is smushed between the trachea, which is being displaced anteriorly, and the dilated aberrant left subclavian artery. At the level of the heart, you notice how the aorta is seen to be descending on the right, which is why we do not see the normal left-sided descending aortic stripe on the frontal view. This is a case of a right-sided aortic arch with an aberrant subclavian artery, which is generally not associated with any major cardiac anomalies, unlike some other congenital aberrant configurations of the aorta. Remember that this aberrant artery can become dilated, known as a diverticulum of Cumarel, which can cause esophageal compression. If symptomatic, this is known as dysphagia lusoria. In addition, this results in a vascular ring around the trachea, completed by the ligamentum arteriosum, which typically arrives from the diverticulum. This can cause tracheal compression and striderous symptoms. Let's now move on to the pulmonary artery and some key points regarding the structure. We should remember that the main pulmonary artery is the bump just below the aortic knob. In general, this contour should not extend beyond a tangential line drawn between the aortic knob and the apex of the left ventricle. Notice how the main pulmonary artery is tucked in, that is medial to this line. What cardiomediastinal contour is abnormal in this case? The ascending aorta looks to be okay. Where is the aortic knob? You may think that this is it, however, this is not the case. If you follow the descending aortic stripe from below, you can see that the aortic knob is actually located just above this bump. This is the location of the normal aortic knob. So the question then becomes, what is this bump? This actually represents the main pulmonary artery and it's way too big. Let's draw again that tangential line from the aortic knob to the left ventricular apex. Remember the main PA is supposed to be deep to it and in this case it's sticking out beyond it. This signifies pulmonary artery enlargement. In addition, the intralobar pulmonary artery, which we see here, is also too big. We see that transverse measurements taken transverse to the orientation of the intralobar pulmonary artery should be less than 16 to 18 millimeters. In this case, it's much larger than that. When the main pulmonary artery is this big, it generally indicates pulmonary hypertension. The pulmonary artery dilation can occur with other processes, such as pulmonary valve stenosis, even in the absence of, pulmonary elevated, of elevated pulmonary arterial pressures. On the right is an extreme case of pulmonary artery enlargement, where a novice reader may interpret the main pulmonary artery as being a mass. There are numerous different causes of pulmonary hypertension, with the World Health Organization breaking them down into five different groups, listed from group one through group five here on the left. This is a case of an atrial septal defect, also known as an ASD. Here's the corresponding cardiac MRI, which is an excellent test to look for cardiac shunt detection. This is a bright blood sequence, four chamber view of the heart. Note the right ventricle, right atrium, left atrium, and left ventricle. Also notice the big heart, and the, sorry, the big hole in the heart reflecting the atrial septal defect, which allows communication with the left atrium and right atrium. Cardiac MRI also allows us to watch the heart contract in real time, where we can see swirling of blood between the two atrial chambers through the large atrial septal defect that was previously noted with the blue star. Let's now move on to the heart. One of the more basic fundamentals of chest x-ray interpretation is assessing for cardiac enlargement. This is most typically done with the cardiothoracic ratio. This is obtained by measuring the right atrium to midline, the most lateral portion of the left ventricle to midline, and then summing them together. A normal heart should be roughly half of the sum of the total width of the chest. Here's an example of cardiac silhouette enlargement 
with one green line marking the outer edge of the right atrium and the other green line marking the outer edge of the left ventricle. Here's the distance from the right atrium to the midline. Here's the distance from the left ventricle to the midline. And then the two green lines here representing the total width of the chest, which is outlined in this orange arrow. We then sum the right atrium distance, the left ventricular distance, and we note how they're larger than half of the total width of the chest. This indicates cardiac enlargement. In general, people do not take these measurements. A simpler and more visual and easier way of doing this is to take the right atrial measurement and see if it fits in the clear space between the outer edge of the left ventricle and the left chest wall. Should it be bigger than this clear space, then by rules of geometry, the heart has to be greater than 50% of the total width of the chest. So this measurement comes with some rules. First, the patient has to be well positioned and not rotated. Second, they have to be upright. Third, it should be obtained as a PA view of the chest, that is posterior to anterior. And lastly, the chest x-ray needs to be acquired during full inspiration. Any of these rules, if not met, could result in pseudo cardiac silhouette enlargement. Here's an example of a patient with chest x-rays obtained within hours of each other. One with low lung volumes and AP technique, the other with an adequate inspiration and PA technique. Look how much the heart changes in size. It's important that when you start reading chest x-rays not to overdiagnose cardiomegaly, particularly on inpatients in portable exams, which are almost never upright, PA, or in full inspiration. You should also note that not all things that enlarge the cardiac silhouette are related to cardiac chamber enlargement. A pericardial effusion can also cause cardiac silhouette enlargement. We would suspect a pericardial effusion should the heart change rapidly in size in the frontal view. The silhouette may appear globular, though I think this is not a very specific or sensitive sign. A more reliable marker is what's known as the oreo cookie or epicardial fat pad sign, which we see on the lateral view. Here's the corresponding lateral view, and note how we see some loosened stripes anteriorly, so let's blow that area up. Notice how we see two loosened lines. This represents fat deep and superficial to the pericardium. The intervening density represents the pericardial effusion, which we see here. The appearance has been likened to that of an Oreo cookie. Corresponding CT demonstrates the pericardial effusion in white, and then the fat, both deep and superficial to it, in gray. Again, really notice those two loosened stripes, a characteristic appearance of pericardial effusion on chest x-ray. There are many causes of pericardial effusion ranging from autoimmune diseases, infections such as tuberculosis, malignancy, and hemorrhage. Inflammatory pericardial effusions can result in complications like seen on this lateral view. Notice the dense white line surrounding the heart representing pericardial calcifications from prior uremic pericarditis. Pericardial calcifications can result in impaired diastolic filling of the heart known as a constrictive cardiomyopathy. Let's now talk about how to recognize if a particular chamber of the heart is enlarged. This can be quite difficult to do, particularly if the heart is globally enlarged, though there are some specific signs that can increase our accuracy. Let's first talk about the left atrium. Remember that the left atrium is largely not contour forming, with the exception of the left atrial appendage, which is generally not discreetly seen as a prominent contour. Some specific signs we will use and address will be the double density sign, enlargement of the left atrial appendage, splaying of the crina, a horizontal orientation of the left main stem bronchus, and displacement of the airways in the lateral view. Notice on the left how there's a relatively smooth border of the upper left heart border, which is just inferior to the left main pulmonary artery. Compare this to the study on the right, which demonstrates left atrial enlargement. Notice the prominent contour below the main pulmonary artery shadow from an enlarged left atrial appendage. Also notice on the right how there appears to be two cardiac contours on the right, one that's deep to the right atrial contour, which we see outlined with these red arrows and shaded in red here. This is what's known as a double density sign, and this signifies left atrial enlargement. If a double density sign is recognized, we can take a measurement from the apex of the left atrial contour to the center of the left main stem bronchus. A measurement greater than seven centimeters is fairly specific for left atrial enlargement, which we could see in this case. 
Also notice, notice the shape of the crina. On a normal study, the crina appears relatively acute. The angle that it forms appears relatively acute. Whereas in the setting of left atrial enlargement, it appears more obtuse. This is the result from infra-adjacent mass effect from an enlarged left atrium, which results in splaying of the crina, a more obtuse appearance of the crina. On the lateral view, the left atrium represents the most superior and posterior aspect of the cardiac contour, which is seen here. When enlarged, it projects more posteriorly and can even overlap the spine, as noted on the right. Also notice how there's mass effect in upward and posterior displacement of the airways secondary to left atrial enlargement. There's posterior airway displacement. Normally, there is a minimal amount of mass effect on the esophagus, which can be observed in the setting of an esophagram. Notice how there's a subtle indentation of the mid-esophagus on this normal person on the left. When the left atrium is enlarged, the mass effect on the esophagus can become quite accentuated, which we see here, a significant extrinsic compression of the esophagus on the esophagram. Some additional findings that we had covered are also present in this case. There is main pulmonary artery enlargement. There's also cephalization. Also notice how the right atrial border on the right appears to be elongated and enlarged, signifying right heart enlargement. The combination of a normal sized left ventricle with left atrial enlargement, findings of pulmonary hypertension and right heart enlargement are suggestive of mitral stenosis, which this patient had. The most common cause is rheumatic heart disease, which has significantly decreased in incidence over the years. Stenosis impedes blood flow into the left ventricle, which then results in left atrial enlargement. Left atrial enlargement results in blood flow backing into the pulmonary veins, leading to pulmonary venous pressures being elevated and cephalization on the chest x-ray. Further backing up of blood into the pulmonary arteries results in elevated pulmonary artery pressures and a dilated main pulmonary artery, with further backing up blood into the right heart resulting in elevated right heart pressures, eventually in a large right heart, and then if left long-standing, could lead to right heart dysfunction. In conclusion, assessing the major cardiovascular structures on chest x-rays is critical. In this lecture, we focus specifically on abnormalities of the aorta, pulmonary arteries, and cardiac silhouette, which demonstrated that it is not only important to assess size, but also shape and location. We also highlighted some ancillary findings, clinical clues, and signs that may lead to a specific diagnosis. Thank you for your time. If there are any questions, please feel free to email me. Thank you.